Declan Ford was born October 9, 2014. As an infant, he lived with his mother, 28-year-old Brittany Ford, and his father in the state of Georgia. In April 2015, Brittany called the police at 3.30 in the morning and claimed Declan's father was abusing him. The police responded to the home and advised Brittany to take the baby and stay somewhere else for the night. She agreed and said she would go to a hotel, but instead, she took Declan and began traveling in her white 2007 Nissan Versa to Columbus, Ohio, where her mother lived. While on her drive to Ohio, she called her mother and said the government was coming after her and she had to get away. Strangely, when she arrived at her mother's, she would accuse her stepfather of abusing her younger sister. Brittany's mother and brother thought she might be suffering from some kind of mental illness and took her to the hospital. She was then admitted to the psychiatric ward. Declan's father went to Ohio and tried to visit her, but she refused to see him. On April 19th, after three days in the hospital, Brittany was released and went to stay with her brother. A few days later, when her brother woke up, Brittany and Declan were gone. She said she was going out to get some food, but never returned. Her family would report her missing on May 7, 2015. On May 14, a police officer in Indiana, unaware that Brittany and Declan were reported missing, helped her change a tire on her car. On May 16, Brittany called her brother from Iowa and asked for $10,000. On May 17, her car was found abandoned on the side of Highway 87 between Billings, Montana and Sheridan, Wyoming. All of her belongings, including her medication and the baby's car seat, were still inside. They were last known to be in the area of Hardin, Montana. There has been no indication of their whereabouts since her car was found abandoned, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Thomas Nelson McNair was born December 2, 1976, in Bozeman, Montana, to Clifford McNair and Arlita Berg. Nelson's parents would separate when he was only five years old. He was described as a sweet kid who grew up in poverty and raised by a hard-working mother. As a child, he spent a lot of time at Chico Hot Springs in the Bridger Mountain and loved to fish at the lagoon in Sacagawea Park. He did not have a lot of structure in his home and apparently did as he pleased. He was a talented artist who was often sketching and drawing pictures. He went to Park High School in Livingston and often found trouble. When he needed space, he would wander to the overpass or under the I-90 bridge to get high or to draw in one of his notebooks. He and his friends enjoyed grunge, nirvana, mountain biking, and skateboarding. According to friends of his, in the mid-90s, if you were a skateboarder in Livingston, you were viewed as nothing more than rebellious with a dark side. Friends said he frequently used marijuana and may have occasionally taken LSD. In the spring of 1995, Nelson expressed frustration to several friends that he had gone too far down the wrong path. One friend remembers a telephone call with Nelson in which he described his desire to get his life together. He alluded that he had been too far into drug activity, and the friend speculated that Nelson might have been helping transport some stuff. A drug raid took place in Park High School in February 1995 that set in motion a series of events which may have led to his death. During the raid, 22 students were all held in one room for many hours. Nelson was found to be in possession of a marijuana pipe and was later ironically fined $420 and given a choice to serve 10 days in jail, which would have caused him to lose credit in all of his classes his senior year or become an informant and narc on his friends. One month after his arrest, Nelson and another student were publicly disclosed as informants on the front page of the Livingston Enterprise. Alarmed by this, the second individual's family moved away. Strangely, Nelson then disappeared the next month on or about March 29, 1995. That night, he and his friends took turns shooting at empty beer bottles at the town dump with a 22 pistol. Nelson then dropped his friends off at home, and his last words were, I'll pick you up tomorrow for school, and they laughed as they referred to the school as jail, as they often did. He then apparently went home and was never heard from again. Strangely, his room, which he usually padlocked when he would leave the house, was found unlocked. 
He had also been working as a dishwasher at the Stockman's Bar and bussing tables at a Mexican cafe, where he had plans to work that weekend, but no one from either place had heard from him. At first, his mother Arlita, who worked graveyard shifts, wasn't alarmed when he went missing. Nothing appeared out of place, and his truck was parked in front of the house as he had left it. Wherever he had gone, he seemingly had gone willingly, either on foot or picked up by someone. After three days without contact, his aunt reported him missing on April 1st, and six days later, his father filed a second missing persons report. The police arrived at his house and ransacked his room. They would confiscate about 10 marijuana plants growing in his closet. However, a 9mm handgun that he kept in his bedroom was never recovered. Sadly, about a month later, on May 4, 1995, fishermen discovered the 18-year-old's body floating in the Yellowstone River, about 14 miles east of Livingston. He was the victim of an apparent drowning. Silt from the banks of the river clogged his lungs, an indicator that perhaps he was held face down and had sucked in the particles. Coroner Al Jenkins told the media in 2002 that there was nothing on the body to indicate that Nelson had been stabbed or shot, but a body traveling in the water suffers all sorts of bruises and abrasions. It's also possible that injury may have been inflicted before he went into the water. An article published immediately following his death stated that the initial forensic tests indicate he drowned and that no foul play was involved in his death. But an investigation would continue to try and determine if it was accidental, a suicide, or something else. Nelson was known to be a fantastic swimmer, and his family does not believe that he simply drowned or that he would commit suicide. On May 15, 1995, a group of Beaverhead County High School students located a note found under a rock near the boat launch at the Carter's Bridge Fishing Access. The note read, Dear God, all my life has been a big mistake. I can do no right. I have no one who cares. No matter how hard I try, I am not a crazy person. I'm just damned to living hell. I can't take much more of it. I'm not living in self-pity either. I've tried. After seeing the note, his mother said, I never believed it was Nelson. He was missing for 36 days, and then it showed up neatly under a rock. First of all, it was too religious. That wasn't Nelson. Other friends and family also don't believe the note is Nelson's. Apparently, his body was cremated without consent of his parents. Coroner Jenkins affirmed this in 2019 and added that he also had nothing to do with ordering the cremation. Family and friends would scatter his ashes near Livingston Peak in late May of 1995. There was a skateboard park built and named after Nelson and Livingston, but it has since been renamed. As for matters of investigation, Coroner Jenkins says that Nelson McNair's mystery remains an open case, but as of today, it remains unsolved. Shakaya Blue Harding was born November 28, 1998, and went by the name Blue. She lived in Billings, Montana, and as a teenager, she would unfortunately suffer from mental illness and drug addiction. She was last seen at the age of 19 on the afternoon of July 23, 2018, walking along Buena Vista Road in Billings. The next day, Blue posted a series of Facebook posts expressing that she was upset about a failed relationship, amongst other things in her life. She posted her final post shortly before midnight, which reads, All depressing, but I'm typing it like it's everything, but relying on feelings suck. All of her social media activity ceased after that, and her family hasn't seen or heard from her again. Her family reports that they had a strained relationship with her prior to her disappearance due to her erratic behavior, but her mother feels like she is still alive. In the months leading up to her disappearance, she was reportedly living on the streets of Billings. However, she always kept in touch with her family. Finally, on August 20th, 2018, her mother reported her missing after a month went by with no word from her daughter. Her sister explained that due to her sister's transient lifestyle and the fact that she had disappeared and returned before, her family did not file an official missing persons report until almost a month later thinking she would eventually turn up. Her family feels like Blue's case has been ignored due to her drug use and the fact that it took them so long to realize she was missing. 
There is unfortunately very little information available in her case. Reports state that she has ties to Fort Riley, Kansas, New Mexico, and Montana, but it is unclear if she has been spotted in those areas. Her family members are concerned for her safety and are desperately seeking answers. There was a possible sighting of her in Arizona in late 2020, but that has never been corroborated. Indigenous people, especially Native women, go missing at a vast disproportionate rate as the general population. Native Americans make up 6.7% of Montana's population, but they account for 26% of missing persons reported in 2016 to 2018. Two-thirds of those cases involve women and girls. The circumstances of her disappearance are unclear, but her loved ones are very concerned and seek answers, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Megan Genovitz was born in Boulder, Colorado on January 12, 1978 to William Genovitz and Donna Smith. When she was two years old, her parents divorced and her mother moved her and her brother Joseph to the timbered foothills in St. Ignatius, Montana along St. Mary Road. They were living in a home in a remote wooded area with free room and board in exchange for her mother's nanny services. In the early afternoon hours of April 30, 1980, Megan was playing with her five-year-old brother and another young boy in the yard while her mother was inside doing chores. She says she only looked away for less than a minute and Megan disappeared. She would last see her daughter on the side of the house near the windows on the porch. Her mother quickly began searching for her and calling the neighbors. There was only one road leading up to her house in 1980, and neighbors said that they did not see any strangers or suspicious vehicles at all that day. Search and rescue arrived on the scene at approximately 6 p.m. that night. However, it became dark and an onslaught of rain and snow made the search more difficult. The creek called Cold Creek near the home turned from a narrow stream into what was described by an investigator as a raging river. Hundreds of people spent long hours looking for Megan for days with no success. Investigators do not believe Megan was abducted. They believe instead she most likely wandered off and drowned in a nearby stream or was attacked by a wild animal such as a grizzly bear. It rained and snowed for 10 days after Megan's disappearance. If she was exposed to the elements, she could not have survived very long. An extensive search of the St. Ignatius area turned up no sign of her. Her father came from Colorado to search for his daughter and would ride the area on horseback and examine animal scat for any trace of her clothing but was unsuccessful. Megan's family believed she was abducted by a stranger to be raised as their own. Megan's mother claims she was never known to wander off and doesn't believe she would go near the creek. Nobody in Megan's family is considered a suspect in her case, and neither of her parents were suspected to have harmed Megan or played a role in her disappearance. If Megan were alive today, she would be 43 years old. Megan's brother Joseph went on to graduate from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Sadly, he was among the more than 20 American tourists reported missing and presumed dead in the devastating South Asian tsunami that killed over 2,300 people in Thailand in 2004. Shannon Claire LeBeau was born on October 31, 1975 in Miller, South Dakota. His mother, Sally LeBeau, was from California and married a man named Gerald Anderson and had five children. In 1966, Gerald was struck by a piece of heavy equipment in a construction accident and died at the age of 30. Sally became widowed at the age of 28 and became solely responsible for her five children, who ranged in age from six months to eight years. She then packed up and resettled on a friend's farm in South Dakota. There she met Val Claire LeBeau, nicknamed Blondie. He was a postal carrier, and the two would have two more children, Shannon in 1975 and Josh in 1977. Val Claire possessed a Jekyll and Hyde personality and was an alcoholic. He was a Vietnam vet and suffered from hallucinations and flashbacks, especially when he drank. Eventually, Sally would also work at the post office, 
divorced Blondie and transferred from South Dakota to another post office in Thousand Oaks, California. Her father was there, dying of cancer, and she wanted to be nearby to take care of him. Only Sally, Shannon, and his younger brother Josh would move with her to California. The rest of Sally's older children remained in South Dakota. Sally again soon filed transfer requests and ultimately moved to Helena, Montana, where she eventually bought a small house at the Ten Mile Creek Estates. Shannon, a sophomore in high school who was very close to his mother, longed for a bond with his father, and he even once convinced Sally to allow him and Josh to move back to South Dakota to live with him. Within months, he and Josh began to resent their father because of his behavior. So Shannon and Josh would return to Helena, and he would try his best to readjust to Helena High School. Shannon and Steve Rommel met while they were students at the high school. The two often lifted weights together at the gym, but Steve had a bad reputation. The more reserved and less confident Shannon would become a follower of Steve and his actions. Shannon graduated from high school in 1994, and a few years later, he met a girl named Leslie, and the couple had a baby girl, but they would never marry. The pair fought frequently, and at times, their arguments were volatile. For starters, Leslie didn't like Shannon's choice of friends, particularly his association with Steve. Shannon and Steve would drink at dingy places and would get into arguments when Shannon stopped his generosity and refused to buy Steve additional drinks. Leslie and Shannon would split up and she told him that he needed to grow up, take on more responsibility, and be more serious about accepting his role as a father. Around that time, Shannon and his own father became further estranged. When Blondie visited his newborn granddaughter, the visit did not end on a good note. Shannon began working as a cook at a busy sports bar in Helena. At one point, his ex-girlfriend Leslie indicated that she was considering returning to Helena with their daughter after a period of estrangement. Shannon was last seen on February 23, 1999, between 9 and 11 a.m. in the vicinity of the 900 block of Kessler Street in downtown Helena. Security cameras recorded him at a local bank around 9 a.m., where he withdrew about $3,000 in cash from the sale of his black Chevy Nova. According to reports, Steve had told Shannon that there was an old farmer who owned a muscle car somewhere close to Townsend, a car that he might like. Steve picked up Shannon, and in his initial statement to the police, he testified that they left Helena to scope out the vehicle and on the way shoot a couple cows. In his initial statement, he told police that he and Shannon were together in the walking mall area at about 11 a.m., Steve told Shannon's mom that after they returned from Townsend, he dropped Shannon off in downtown Helena at about 11 a.m. Steve also told Sally that Shannon relayed a message through him to his mother that she should go lock up his mobile home and pick up his checks from work. Clearly, Shannon intended to go to Townsend and either view or purchase a car from an acquaintance of Steve's. According to multiple witnesses, Shannon had been very excited about buying the vehicle. Two days before Shannon's disappearance on February 21st, 1999, Steve had asked a friend whether they had a pistol that he could borrow as he needed to help a rancher kill a cow. According to investigative reports, Steve told multiple different stories of the day Shannon disappeared. He told one group of people that he dropped Shannon off in downtown Helena, and yet another that he had taken Shannon to the bus station in Butte because Shannon was afraid of someone that he owed money to. Another witness stated that Steve said that he drove clear to Billings and dumped his friend off there. Shannon's red 1976 Chevrolet truck with the Montana license plate number 5T31420 apparently disappeared with him and has never been recovered. Steve has a very extensive criminal history. His first felony conviction dates back to 1994 on a theft charge. Since then, he has had arrest for obstructing a police officer, unlawful transaction with a minor, domestic abuse, tampering with or fabricating evidence, concealed weapons violations, and numerous probation violations. According to reports, Steve often made fun of Shannon and his hair, called him a girl, and used Shannon's friendship for his own benefit. Steve also allegedly threatened to kill a woman and stated that his older brother was a high priest of Satan worshippers who had previously disposed of bodies. 
According to witness depositions, after Shannon vanished, Steve frequented the sports bar where Shannon worked, inquiring about the investigation. Shannon's disappearance has been treated as a homicide from the beginning. On June 8, 1999, Steve showed up at a used car lot in Helena and traded in the vehicle that he owned at the time of Shannon's disappearance, an orange 1976 Chevrolet pickup truck. When the Helena police confiscated that vehicle for crime lab analysis, the truck had been cleaned and detailed within the last few days. Two days after the police returned the vehicle to the car dealer's lot, it was stolen. There was no broken glass in the lot, and it is assumed that the person who stole the vehicle had an extra set of keys. It has never been seen since. Searches have been conducted using cadaver dogs, on foot, and also by air. Authorities have searched streams and ditches, mine shafts and dark holes, even the cement plant that once employed Steve's father. One year after Shannon's disappearance, Steve Rommel was detained on a sexual assault charge. In a federal court appearance in 2001, he was remanded to the custody of the marshals after a detention hearing where a Helena police officer testified that the only real lead in Shannon's case led to Steve. He served his time on the sexual assault charge, and as a habitual violent offender, he must register his whereabouts with the state of Montana and apparently still lives there. Sadly, Shannon's mother died from cancer in 2007, shortly after Shannon was declared legally dead. In 2019, his daughter welcomed a son into the world. Earlier that same year, at her wedding celebration in Idaho, an empty chair was placed at the front row of the main aisle for her father. As of today, Shannon has never been found and this case remains unsolved.